The world is the way it is because those who have power want it to be this way. A very simplistic statement, you might think. I've chosen it to explore some of my concerns about how aid and development studies are changing for the worse under current systems of power. Of course, the phrase those who have power is shorthand for a complex set of interlocking and conflicting interests. But in different places and at varying scales, those with power have the ability to command systems that allocate resources, assets such as land and water, jobs, livelihoods and income. And these allocations are not natural or God-given, they are socially constructed. The ways that the powerful command these assets and income are designed to produce benefits for the minority. They are not an accident. The economic powerful, economically powerful also dominate systems of politics that legalize and legitimize these allocations and determine the rates of taxation that are usually low and these can therefore not be used to support greater equity. These systems of power themselves are the reason there is much of the suffering in the world that development aid and research claims to be trying to fix. The way resources and incomes are allocated is the reason aid is supposed to, supposedly needed to fix the problems caused by power. Forms of power include not only capitalism, which is often seen misleadingly in terms of the one or even the 10%, but it involves different kinds of power which affect hundreds of millions of people um, through semi-feudal systems of land tenure and other local power um, approaches. But power also involves conflicts of gender, ethnicity, caste, sexuality, age, and disability. Why would those who benefit from these systems be willing to give them up? Are we confident that development aid is trying to achieve things that would challenge those who have power, which is what would be required for real change? Would aid and research be different if we were not dependent on those who have power for funding? What would it take to really decolonize aid and development studies? Now, I fully realize that what I'm saying oversimplifies, but does it simplify away from the truth or in the direction of greater honesty? I think that many aid interventions have a very low potential for changing the ways that the powerful decide what happens in the world. Do we think that development interventions can somehow be neutral and not disturb the powerful? If what is done in the name of development is neutral to power, can it do much good? Are we confident and are the funders confident that after 10 years, there will still be some evidence that what happened with the aid is still visible and having an impact? I want to test that. One of the things I want to come out of this talk is a, a project which I call 10 plus the development checker, in which I hope we can develop a methodology which will involve lots of volunteers going to different project sites, which finished around 10 years ago, and find out what evidence there is that those activities, those aid projects actually existed. Now, of course, that's going to be a big challenge for the organizations that funded those activities, ranging down from the UN down to NGOs. But I think if they are honest about what they want to do in having an impact, then they would be uh, open to the idea that this would be tested by the 10 plus development checker. So if you're interested to do, please make contact um, to see if we can set this up um, in, in the coming year. How can we build back better and different? Is it possible to build back better under existing systems of power? I argue that it is only possible to build back better if it is also different. Where the systems of power are changed so that resources and incomes are distributed more fairly and oppression is reduced. That of course is not easy. Going against power is difficult and can be risky. What I'm really calling for is greater honesty so that if the aid and research cannot be effective without changing power, then we must say so. If a problem such as hunger cannot be solved without changing the systems that cause hunger, we must say so. Can development studies help? Well, development aid claims to influence the way power is used to push back against some of the negative impacts. 
Development study supposedly provides the research that both identifies who needs help and who should, how it should happen. I believe that development research is increasingly avoiding analysing the causes of exploitation and oppression, because otherwise the funding wouldn't be available. We are embedded within systems of power that use aid for power. Development organisations do what they can do rather than what is needed by poor and oppressed peoples. How different would our ideas, our analysis and our behaviour be if we were not having to do it for and within our organisations? Development research organisations are even trying to increase their funding from billionaire philanthropists, sorry, tax evaders. People from the 1% who are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Can we always claim that we are investigating the real causes of the problem we are claiming to help to fix if we fall into these patterns? And do the standard claims made for our interventions to be effective, do they actually work? The kind of claims that we make that we are participatory, grassrooted, community-based or community-led, involving local ownership, pro-poor, leaving no one behind and using empowerment, empowering people. All of these buzzwords are deeply criticised. Some of the criticisms of them go back decades, but yet they still remain the standard ways by which we justify that things can work and be valid in terms of development interventions. I think we get sucked into using dev speak and jargon that fails to deal with root causes and instead enables the reason problems exist to be covered up. We are full of jargon words that rip meaning out of analytical research. Food security, governance, resilience, sustainable, transformation. For example, do we ever think about how long serious transformational change may take? Can it possibly happen in a development project that lasts three to five years. In Britain, votes for women took a hundred years to achieve with great struggle. In ending exploitative feudal land tenure systems in much of Asia and Latin America may take years. I'll give an example of food security, which I think is a great example of terminology which has been ripped away from actually understanding the causes towards something which is not challenging to those causes because they are influenced by power. So we've moved from the idea of hunger. 30 years ago, we would have talked about hunger, not food security. People are hungry. People can't get enough to eat. Ah, oh, then the intervention of systems of power says, oh, we need to introduce more, uh, we need to produce more food. More food needs to be produced. So instead of it being an argument about how people have access to food, whether they can grow enough from their own land or have enough income to buy food, the answer to food is not um, uh, analysing hunger and its causes, but producing more food. When we know that in many situations where people are hungry, it is not because there is a shortage of food. And so the argument goes from explaining hunger to actually the need for food security, which is a safe terminology, which does not involve looking at the systems of power that make people hungry. Development is embedded within existing systems of power and trying to push against them, but actually it's contaminated and distorted by those power systems in order to fit more comfortably within them. And it fails to adequately challenge them because they pay us. Development studies, including IDS and aid, were born from the colonial systems that subjugated much of the world until the 1970s. IDS recently celebrated, why would it celebrate its 50th anniversary? Instead of reflecting on why is it still necessary to have development research? I think that development research is now integrated into the bogus binary of developed, developing, global north, global south. I think this bogus binary disguises why people suffer in this world by pretending that there is something special or exceptional about each of these sets of countries. This overrides 
the understanding of the processes of exploitation and oppression which take place in all countries. Hunger in Britain may have different types of explanations than that of hunger in, say, India or Tanzania, but to assess them as if there are two types of countries, rather than analysing the causes of hunger wherever it happens to be, can be very misleading. Now, of course, the causes in India will not be the same as in Tanzania, and the causes of hunger in one part of India will not be the same as in another part of that country. But the value of having a developing and developed binary of two sets of countries is only useful for the convenience and the value of perpetuating the system of the more country, powerful countries wanting to use this bogus binary. Aid and development research becomes a way of perpetuating the idea that there are two sets of countries that are different. It becomes essentially neo-colonial because instead of examining why problems happen wherever they happen, it assumes that one set of countries has the answers and the funding and that these must be transferred from us to them. And this, in my view, disguises what are the causes of the problems and how those causes relate to the systems of power within which aid and development studies are themselves embedded. Thank you very much.